Good morning and welcome to today's Knowledge Bank, the three R's, roles, responsibilities and resolutions. Uh, News on the Block have invited two excellent experts today from JPC to discuss this topic. Award-winning Yashmin Mistry, she heads up the real estate team and she's being joined by her colleague, Andrew Morgan, who is responsible for the corporate team. Um, it's going to be an interactive session, so I'm going to hand over straight to Yashmin and Andrew, um, and uh, they are looking forward to um, to you joining them today. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Very well. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very yeah. well. Very happy with Boris's news and uh, looking forward to the end of lockdown. Absolutely, aren't we? That's what I'm sure you are. Right, I'm going to hand straight over to you two, so um, enjoy your session. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Charlotte. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to today's webinar, uh, which is our call for Company Law Basics for Property Managers. My name is Yashmin, um, and I'm joined here by my fellow partner, Andrew Morgan, who, guys, absolutely loves the Companies Act. Now, Andrew has an unhealthy fascination for the Companies Act. So, which you'll find out over the next 60 minutes or so. And a li little secret, which I think he won't mind me sharing with you, is that whenever Andy goes to sleep, the Companies Act or his little blue book or his big blue book is not very far away from him, is it? it is. He's just going to show you, there you go, that's how much he loves the Companies Act. Um, so the next 60 minutes, Andrew will explain all there is to know about the Companies Act, the relevant sections uh, that you need to be aware of, um, and that you will use in your day-to-day -day lives as property managers. So in terms of today's session, we'd really like this to be as interactive um, as possible for all of you, um, rather than just Andrew and uh, myself just talking at you for the next 60 minutes or so. And for those of you that have attended our training sessions before, we're normally in real life, there'll be lots of Prosecco and there'll just be lots of chocolate throwing at you for 60 seconds. Unfortunately, we can't really replicate that over the vir virtual web um, effectively. However, there are two ways in which you can get in contact with us or uh, raise any questions that you've got with us throughout the session. The first one is through the chat box. So at the bottom of the screen, you will have, or you should be able to see in the middle, a chat box. Uh, whilst I'm just finishing off the introduction and to assure Andrew that he's not just sitting here with me, talking about the various bits of the company that if you want to type into the chat box um, your name the company that you're from and we'll give you a shout out as 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 you send those through the second way to uh, contact us is uh, via the question and answer set, uh, chat box um, which um, obviously we've got a question and answer session at the end of the session um, but if you would like what we uh, send them through as and when um, you think of the questions and we will try to either deal with them as we're dealing with the topic or we'll deal with them at the end. So thank you for interacting with us. A big shout out to Samantha Massey. She was the first one in. Hello. Um, and then we've got Danny. We've got John Simpson from West End Key. Um, Craig Jones, big shout out for you. Um, lovely. So Andrew, you're not just sitting here with me. <laughs> I hope that gives you some yeah. comfort. Yeah, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> um, okay, guys, so what does the next 60 minutes look like? Well, Andy and I thought we would divide it into three parts. Uh, the first part dealing with the uh, more practical questions that you would have as uh, property managers, probably the things that we think that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Part two um, will see us dealing with various uh, resolutions and meetings and, uh, and the process and timelines and, and that kind of thing that you need to be aware of. Um, and part three, and this is the bit that Andrew's super excited about, we'll look at important sections that you as property managers need to be aware of, of the Companies Act. And as you can see, he's already got his blue book out and ready waiting for you guys. <laughs> so Andrew, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, for you guys out there, for the property managers, for most of you that have contacted me in the past with a question, there's probably two things that I will ask you first off when you throw a question at me. First of all, I would normally ask you, who is our client? Who, who am I providing advice to? And the second thing I would normally say is, what is the lease? 
So Andrew, when you're throwing a company's act question, what's the first thing, what do you think guys is the first thing that he's gonna ask? Probably gonna ask, who is the client? That you're advising is that right Andrew? i hope so yeah, no it is it is who is who is the client is is the client going to be the company uh is the client going to be a shareholder or shareholders um yeah that that is definitely the first port of call yeah. i'm glad i've got that bit right so yeah. on that basis andrew talk to me about what it means to be a director well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for your time this morning. I'm not sure that I'm ever going to recover from the uh, unhealthy uh, interest in the Companies Act 2006. <laughs> I shall try. Um, what does it mean to be a director? Well, fundamentally, again, let's turn back to the Companies Act 2006. It's the largest piece of legislation that exists on the statute books. Section 154 of that Act requires a company to have at least one director. Uh, it's not limited to one, but um, it should be a, a minimum of, of one director. And a director essentially is an agent that is uh, responsible for the management of the company and its performance. Um, the office of a director really is an agency on behalf of the members of the company to ensure that the company is run in as best fashion as it possibly uh, can be. Um, if you ever want to have a good overview of what a director is, just simply go to the Institute of Directors and therein you'll find on, on their website a, a, a good and solid uh, definition of what a director is. Thanks, Andrew. So could I, as a director, have a contract or something between which is drawn up between myself and the company? Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that today's session will be um, insightful. I'll be dipping into what it's like with directors and trading companies. But equally, I want to make sure that we focus on circumstances that prevail or are more prevalent towards property management contexts. Um, in theory, a director can have a contract, and that contract is between the director and the company, in the same way that an employee would have a contract between him or herself and the company. Here, what we call the contract between the director and the company is a service agreement, um, other than an employment uh, contract. And a service agreement is slightly different because it contains more stringent obligations on the part of the director. Um, you tend to find, though, that in property management circumstances, no such agreements exist. Um, and that's usually because of the affinity between the mix of shareholder and director. So the answer to the question is, yes, you can have one. But in property management circles, you don't tend to find that it's used. OK, thanks, Andrew. So a director is an officer of the company. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, but do I, as a director, or would I, owe duties of confidentiality, and who do I owe those to? So when we, when we talk about duties as a whole, um, the Companies Act 2006 lays down a number of duties, and they are set out in sections 171 to 177. The duty of confidentiality that a director owes is owed by the director as an individual, so every director owes this duty, to the company itself. And that duty of confidentiality is really to safeguard the confidential aspects of the company, its financial position, um, its contracts with other third parties. All of that would be deemed to be the know-how and the trade secrets of the company. So over and above the duty of confidentiality, which is owed between director and company, we then have these other statutory duties, and they include, for example, a duty to promote the success of the company, a duty to act in its best interest, by way of example. Okay, so being a director sounds pretty scary. Does that come, or does the role come with a sense of liability, whether that be personal yes. or not? Yes, it does. Um, because of, the, of, of the, the nature of responsibility for directors, yes, responsibility carries with it 
a burden of potential pitfall in the form of punishment. The Companies Act contains many various provisions about fines that directors are subject to if accounts are filed late, but the more stringent obligations um, that can uh, result in a liability issue occurring would include contexts where directors uh, breach health and safety regulations or people will have heard of situations involving corporate manslaughter where the directors can be convicted of corporate manslaughter because of the actions that they have or haven't undertaken in their office as director. I think it's also worth pointing out that probably some of the viewers will have seen that articles will carry an indemnity at the back of the articles in favour of directors. And the indemnity reads in general terms that there is a protection afforded to directors. But that statement comes with a warning because even though the indemnity is available, it isn't afforded to directors contractually. Just because I'm a director of a management company doesn't mean that that indemnity is there for me. Why? Because technically at law, the articles are a contract. They're a charter between the members of the company and the company itself. And so therefore, directors should be advised to either obtain insurance to cover their actions, or to make sure that service agreements are entered into so that there is a contract between the company and the director, including that indemnity. If you don't have the insurance and you don't have the uh, indemnity in the service agreement, you could be exposed. Okay, great. So quite a scary role to be a director. And I'm sure the property managers out there have come across situations where you've got blocks where people just don't wanna be directors. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a real life example. Something that's just uh, uh, popped through, um, which kind of relates to, to, to the whole company setup and, uh, and, and things is, is a question. So for the protection of directors or shareholders, is it better to have uh, the freehold company or the nominee um, as uh, limited by guarantee or by shares? I don't, I'm not sure whether that deals with the protection, but can you talk to us a little bit, sorry, about the difference between them by guarantee and by shares? Yes, I mean, I think, that, I mean, the, the general answer to the question is that both are trying to achieve the same principle. If we take a company limited by guarantee, the members of that co company are, their, their liability is limited to usually a set amount that is uh, a set amount, a set sum, and it can be 20 pounds or 10 pounds or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that's particular to members of a limited company by guarantee. With a private limited company, a private limited company by shares, the principle is still the same, that my personal liability is limited to my, uh, to, to my the, the nominal value that I've paid for the shares. So they're both, they're different corporate beasts but they're both under, underlying the individual corporate structures is the same principle. Um, they're both looking to protect members uh, in the case of companies limited by guarantee and members of league shareholders for private limited companies from exposure uh, to claims, for example. Great, thank you very much. And obviously a right to manage company, you can only have a right to manage company which is limited by guarantee right. rather yeah. than limited by share. Okay, thank you. So that's directors. Company secretary. So I have heard, and I don't know whether I've heard correctly, but the Companies Act doesn't necessarily specify the role of a company secretary. Is that right? And yes. if so, what does it mean to be a company secretary then? Yeah. So in April 2008, the law changed to the extent that prior thereto, we had, um, or companies had enjoyed the formality of a company secretary being appointed. And a company secretary really does what it says on the tin in as much as that that individual is in charge of the administrative affairs of the company, filing the accounts, making sure that annual returns or a new money confirmation statements are um, filed on behalf of the company. Um, but in April 2008, that obligation, that statutory obligation to have that person in office actually went away. And so what we're left with now is um, a situation where companies can exclude a company secretary from being appointed if they choose to do so. If you would like 
that functionality, however, and a lot of companies do, then of course you can still affect a company secretary appointment. And it is a very useful um, person to have on board to complement your team, but not everyone wants to, to necessarily have that individual. Yeah, so in practice, I think most managing agents are for ma property management companies tend to be, form this company secretarial yes. role essentially mm -hmm. um for for the viewers out there yes. okay thanks andrew so uh, that's company secretary and that's the directors um, a term that i've heard used more often is something called a person of significant control mm -hmm. um what is that um, and why can you explain a bit about why yeah. that role has been created? Please? Sure. Yeah. So uh, over the course of the last 10 to 15 years, more particularly, I think it's fair to say that um, Western governments have tried to incorporate more of a transparent um, operational existence for companies that get formed. And this change in mentality came about after the financial crisis of circa 2008, where a lot of companies were taking money offshore and governments realized that there was a definite need to make matters more transparent because the Western economies were in tatters and there needed to be some whole scale um, move to repair the way that companies could behave. Bringing it closer to home, as far as we're concerned, um, legislation was introduced to ensure that these people of significant control or PSCs, as we abbreviate them to, are named on the company's register at company's house. So when you go into um, search for a company, you will find under the people element that there will be listed therein a PSC or PSCs. And those individuals are people that hold more than 25% of the share capital in the company and are entitled to 25% or more of the voting rights enjoyed through holding that share capital. The obligation so far as a PSC is concerned is to make sure that the individual um, properly records all of their details at company's house and those details include uh, obviously their full name, uh, their residential address, and so forth and such like. When a PSC changes, and this would occur, for example, if you had a company with, you know, 10 leases overall, and five of them were owned by one person, the, the law requires uh, uh, you to address the filing of that new individual's information within a period of 14 days. And if you don't, then the board uh, is subject to a fine if that criteria isn't adhered to. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. We've got two questions that have come in, uh, which I think should be easy ones to answer. Um, if the memorandum and articles of association re do require a company secretary, mm -hmm. does the Companies Act 2006 overwrite that requirement, uh, which is set out in the articles? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the answer to that is no. The articles continue to prevail. Uh, and of course, you, you tend to find that um, you've got one or two ways to, to proceed. Either the company secretary is still a very useful um, position to, to uphold that the company wants to continue, in which case you carry on with it because the Act doesn't act retrospectively to remove those persons pre-08. Um, or to the extent that the articles say that that individual is required, um, but it's clear that it's no longer necessary to, to affect the position, um, that that individual can either resign or the board uh, of directors can vote to remove them. And those are the only two ways that you can deal with. So just because the person is set out to hold office within the articles, um, and the law since 08 has changed the situation doesn't mean automatically they go by the wayside. In fact, a lot of companies will want them to continue. Um, I hope that answers the question. Right, thank you. Um, and I think this is a question that you, uh, possibly I may know also, but are members the same as shareholders? 
Do you want to go ahead and answer no, that? No, 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 because I'm scared that I'll get it wrong. So you go. You are the knowledge of the <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, look, lawyers tend to use the simple answer to the question is shareholders are the, the same as members. Um, you tend to find that, and we'll go back to this position in terms of a company limited by guarantee, members is the actual um, name that's given to the shareholders in quotes because they're not they're not shareholders they are members so they kind of mean the same thing certainly with private limited companies people use the terms interchangeably with one another but in actual fact um, you you can have a distinction between members and shareholders is that is that what you were thinking or did you? I think that's exactly what I was thinking thank you very much Andy. <laughs> okay. um, so that's the key players effectively of a um, company uh, that property managers would generally uh, come across. Um, so in terms of practical day-to-day -day issues that property managers deal with, um, a question that I was asked literally last week by a property manager uh, was um, a situation where um, the freehold company was, um, sorry, there was this freehold company uh, set up. Some of the flats had shares in the freehold, some, some didn't. Um, and the directors were approached by a developer to see whether there was appetite at the, at the development for a rooftop development. Mm -hmm. um, so the question that most property managers kind of tend to ask is, are, is there a quick way of finding out from the articles whether certain decisions have to be taken by the board or whether certain decisions, like in this development case, would have to uh, then be, you know, the shareholders would, or yeah. members would have to be consulted. Yeah, yeah. Th and this crops up all the time, and it's not, it's not limited, of course, to property management context, because there are many times with trading companies, you know, small family-owned private companies, where this question rears its head. Um, Look, in general terms, the position with regard to directors, we go back to what a director is. A director is an officer of the company whose sole purpose is to be responsible for management and performance. The law tries to create a division between the powers and responsibilities of the directors and what the shareholders can do. Now, yes, admittedly, the directors do answer ultimately to the shareholders. But my, and we have sort of not a difference of opinion, but we come to it in two different ways. My initial response is to say it is for the directors to make decisions unilaterally about the management of the company. They don't, they don't need to necessarily go to members to obtain an authorization to proceed, to green light a particular project. However, um, of course, your point would be, and quite validly so, that for the purposes of good estate management and transparency, that often um, it is a good exercise for the board to liaise with members on certainly on matters such as this from time to time as and when required. The difficulty with doing that and following that through on all occasions is that the lines become blurred in the sense that shareholders consider themselves over time, if that behavior pattern continues from one year to the next, to have a right to voice concerns about what the board is doing. And that's where you have to be a little bit careful because the board's responsibility is to manage the company. That's not down to the shareholders. They may want a voice on resolutions at general meetings and so forth, but there is a division between the two. So I think in answer to your question, it's quite right that obviously a, a board of directors would go to the shareholders to take their opinion and in property management circles, you can understand because there's affinity between board members and the members and lessees because they're kind of, you know, cut from the same cloth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the board has to do that all the time. Okay, so essentially there's nothing in the articles or the Companies Act which, you know, say that Every decision or no. um, a, certain decisions need to be um, or shareholders need to be consulted. So that's, that's, that's the basic starting point for property managers, and then we build on that in terms of estate management principles and all of that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Perfect. Another example that's normally thrown at me um, from property managers on a day-to-day -day basis is the usual 
situation that normally crops up at four o'clock on a Friday, where the property manager is alerted to a development um, where someone's decided to start some works. Sometimes, not always, it's a director um, of a company that is wanting to undertake alteration works. Um, and the question that sometimes property managers um, get stuck with or is thrown at them is that the director wants to take part in the discussions as to whether consent should be granted or not in terms of those alterations, whether they're entitled to see the email correspondence or the discussions in relation to mm -hmm. whether consent should be granted or not. And finally, whether the, di the director who's got an interest in obviously the alterations, be the consent for alterations being granted, whether they can actually take part in that voting. So mm -hmm. do you want to talk through? Yeah essentially the principles yeah, there yeah sure and i think probably if ever there were one scenario that this this issue comes up time and time again it's very much in this in this environment yeah. with trading companies it's obviously relevant but i think in property circles it's much more prevalent so our starting point um with regard to this context is again going back to what the director's duties and obligations and responsibilities are and we start again with sections 171 to 177. Why? Because section 175 includes a duty on the director to avoid conflicts of interest. And when we talk about conflicts of interest, we're talking about two types, either direct conflicts or indirect conflicts. And they could be conflicts that are live events in the here and now, or they could be conflicts that could potentially manifest themselves in due course. We move from section 175 to 177 because 177 obligates the director to disclose the interests that they have in a particular matter. Uh, sorry, to disclose the conflict of interest in a particular matter. So we start with section 175 and we move to the actual obligation on the part of the director to make the declaration uh, of the conflict of interest. Now, in terms of what happens in order to reach a decision, um, when I'm drafting board minutes for corporate transactions, one of the first things that you attend to in the drafting is the declaration of the interest. Now, moving on within the board minute and therefore the board meeting, um, the individual is not allowed to count in the quorum if there is a conflict of interest, and neither are they allowed to vote when a vote is undertaken by the board. Sometimes it can be the case that the Articles of Association will allow the board to authorise a, confl a conflicted position. Um, I tend to take a fairly sort of black and white uh, rule to the treatment of conflicts, direct, indirect and potential conflicts, because I think it, it safeguards the board's attack from members who then come along and say, well, why did that director participate? Often explaining the technicalities of what the articles allow um, seems to be like pushing water uphill. It's just easier to say that if a director has a, is conflicted or there's a reasonable um, prospect of a conflict of interest, just exclude them from um, the meeting and proceed like that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so before we move on to virtual meetings, which is a hot topic at the moment, we've just got some um, small questions that have come through um, that relate to directors and roles and responsibilities of companies, which is probably a good time to deal with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, one question that's come through is that, is there anything wrong with an RTM director asking for a salary for their time commitment? Do you want to, what would you, what would you say before I answer that? What would you say in the first instance? No, that's putting me on the spot. You're the expert here. No, 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 um, you're not here. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's a question that comes across in practice quite a lot of the time. Um, in terms of, it's most of my right to manage clients, um, their directors don't take salaries um, because, but I understand on the other side, it's the time commitment um, that, especially in the bigger blocks, um, that um, people are giving up because everyone's got their day jobs and at the same time that they're trying to deal with the management of it. It's not, I don't think it's particularly um, an issue with right to manage 
company directors. I think that happens with freehold company directors, um, management company directors, that they do, there is a lot to take on. Um, on the smaller blocks, obviously, the day-to-day -day management um, effectively is farmed out to managing agents that deal with the recovery of service charges, Section 20, all of that kind of thing. So the directors have their meetings. But I do understand it is a bit of a, a pressure, and it's a question that's asked all the time. So, Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that. I think probably the, the points that I, I would make in, in conjunction with what you've said are as follows. Um, sometimes you will find in the articles of association that they allow for professionals such as lawyers and accountants to be able to levy a fee for the services that those individuals provide in a professional capacity. That seems reasonable because if you think about it, they probably would do it at a discount, I'm sure, but equally if, if they didn't provide those services, the company would then have to go out and contract to get those services coming in. So they'd end up paying for them anyway. So you may sometimes, you don't tend to find them in modern sets of articles anymore, but you do tend to find them in older sets of articles of association. Um, but yes, absolutely, you're right. You know, it doesn't tend to be the case in property management circles that charges um, are levied by directors. But equally, I'm always of the view that you can actually find some very, very capable individuals on the boards of these management companies that bring a lot of experience and skill to the company that ultimately can save it money. And so my question is, the starting point is, what is the capability set of the individual? What value are they bringing to the company? And sometimes there is a legitimate value which underpins the fact that they should be paid. Yeah. The other thing to think about, obviously, is whether, yes, it's all very well being able to uh, direct us to uh, claim a salary. Uh, but the question then is, under what provisions do you recharge that to the leaseholders? So yes. where does the salary come from? Because yes. um, obviously you've got the lease, which sets out what you can and cannot put through the service charge as expenditure. Mm. Um, and then you've got the articles, which say possibly something different. Now, where you've got a freehold company, for example, or a right to manage company, where not everybody across the board are going to be members of either the freehold company or the right to manage company. The question is, is that putting an extra burden on those mm. that have exercised the right to manage or exercise the right, um, sorry, the freehold purchase or the collective mm -hmm. um, to then, you know, pay a director um, via their hat as shareholder because that cost can't be put through the lease if that yes, makes sense it does yeah it does um i talk about articles and um, a question that's come through can we adopt any of the latest acts so I, I think this relates to some of the articles still um refer to or still subject to the companies act 1948 can they change their articles they, 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 they yeah they can um we're tending to find, or we have found over the course of the last 10 years, that moving from uh, those companies, those historic companies with the Companies Act 1948, and I still, every year, I still come across, even with private trading companies, it's always a surprise, but yes, you can do. Um, we'll get on to shortly how one amends up or how a board or shareholders amend up articles of association, what you have to do. But the Companies Act 06 introduced a model set of articles. Now, I'm going to concentrate here on private limited companies just by way of example, but it's very easy actually to move over to a new set of articles because there's a published does what it says on the tin set that the majority of companies that clearly all companies that were incorporated after the Companies Act 06 came into being were adopting and they're finessed in various different ways. But yes, the answer to the question is you can amend and change. We're giving away the answers to the, the scenarios well, that are coming of, up. Sort of. <laughs> um, okay, virtual meetings, hot topic yes. at the moment. Um, obviously with COVID, um, you know, some meetings have taken place, AGMs may not or may, may have met or may not have taken place. Um, I know or I've heard something about a moratorium being in place Till the 31st of March, I think. Yes. Um, so the question, Andrew, is um, should directors be thinking about changing their articles? Because like ways of working, 
people have got used to working from home and the new way of working practices is probably going to be a mix of working mm. from home and working in the office. Yes. Similarly with companies, um, should directors be thinking about uh, changing their articles so they can do meetings virtually and AGMs virtually, um, or should they just sit back and wait for the government to amend legislation? Yeah, um, you, you're right. It, 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 is a, it is a hot topic and, it, and certainly through COVID, it's, it's an inquiry that's come up <laughs> from clients from time to time. Um, where does the law stand at the moment? Well, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act of 2020, um, which was introduced as essentially in the heart of COVID, has allowed companies, because of the restrictions that were under, because of lockdown, et cetera, to hold these virtual general meetings. Um, and of course, you're right, the question is, well, once that moratorium ends at the end of March, what do we do? Can companies now continue to enjoy what COVID has introduced because we've had to get used to it, which is the virtual nature of what we're, what we're doing today? I think the first thing to say is that Section 360 of the Companies Act already foresaw back in 2006 um, the increasing ability for companies to introduce technology for the benefit of members. Now, that particular section introduced the um, ability for members to participate in a general meeting in what the Act describes as electronically. Um, and what that means is that if I want, if I can't physically attend the meeting, so long as I can participate in the meeting, I can hear the meeting being undertaken and I can exercise my vote, um, then the law already allows that. But of course, that's specific to a physical meeting occurring and a broadcast taking place from the venue. What is difficult for lawyers at the moment to assess is that when a client comes and says, well, I now want to amend up the articles, Andrew, so we can hold general meetings um, over Zoom or Teams or whatever. Um, I just want that done. The one fly in the ointment for us as lawyers at the moment is that Section 311 of the Companies Act requires that when you're submitting a notice to members, notifying them of the terms of the meeting, the date when it's going to take place, the time. You also have to then set out where the place of the meeting is going to be. And that's enshrined in the law. Now with a remote or virtual meeting, there is no place. And so the question now for lawyers is, if we go ahead and amend our articles, do we breach the notice provisions that the law requires us to adhere to and in breaching those provisions does that impact on the integrity of the meeting now i don't doubt that obviously the law has got to catch up with what we're all now enjoying and it will do in a period of time but it hasn't as yet so the options are at the moment as you suggest uh, they are either we wait for the law to catch up and leave articles as they stand at the moment um, which is my preference for the time being, or you can go ahead and mark up the articles and just hope that, of course, you know, uh, th th it'll be all right on the night, as it were, and that there won't be ramifications for breach of Section 311. I guess we've got no news of, um, I, I guess the government's um, busy Not doing other more. things at the moment in terms of whether they are going to force the issue themselves or not really. I, I, I think... I. Th I think actually in many ways the government has learned to react a lot more quickly to business practically in terms of furlough and so forth and I think that this is one of those areas that is going to require speedy government movement on as well because technology just is taking over and the law has got to catch up with that. Thank you very much. Right, so we've got some practical scenarios and I think we may have given some of the questions, uh, the answers away to these scenarios. So um, hopefully everybody, I'm just about to share my screen and go through some practical examples. So hopefully you can see this. We've got situation A on the screen. Uh, this is Andrew. This is where we have been approached by um, a lessee owned freehold company and the freehold company wishes to change its name and it also wishes to make changes to the articles. Now changes to the freehold uh, company's article 
all the registered name must be passed by written uh, must be passed by resolution of the members as opposed to the directors. So could you talk us through the simplest way of putting that into practice in terms of um, not having to call for a general meeting? Um, yeah, okay. sure. So again, and actually let's start with that point. Um, in order to amend the articles, and we were talking about this a couple of minutes ago, um, the members have to authorise a change to the articles. As you rightly said, the board can't do it. Um, and that's because the articles are a charter between the members or shareholders and, and the company itself. So we've either got two options. We either go down the route of calling a general meeting, but who wants to do that because it's costly, it's time consuming, et cetera, et cetera. The swifter way of dealing with this requirement in this scenario A is for the members to basically circulate, to have circulated to them what we call a written resolution. Now, the Companies Act 283, Section 283 allows articles of association to be amended. So the law is on our side if we want to make changes. But those changes can only be made and a new set of articles adopted and produced with the changes in if at least a majority holding 75% of the persons entitled to vote is achieved. So if you have 50%, you can't pass the resolution to change the articles. So you must have 75%. In order to complete uh, this exercise, really the sections, sections 291 to 298 of the Act are prevalent here. The note, the resolution, the written resolution, the text of the resolution can be sent to members electronically. It doesn't have to be. Usually I attach them to an email. I send them out to all of the members and wait for them to come back signed. It can go out uh, in, in the post as well. Or in certain circumstances, it can also be hosted on the company's website in conjunction with sending off on email. Um, basically, how is that ratified? Well, the, the law requires that the member or the shareholder receiving the resolution has got to communicate their acceptance of it and that's usually done simply by signing where their name is um, and dating it. A written resolution, just in terms of what it looks like as an animal, is two sides of, of A4. The first page is usually the text of the resolution, the statement about amending the articles. And then the second page um, sets out um, some administrative criteria about what, how members are to treat the resolution, how they're to return it, and all of that is important because the law requires the written resolution to contain various statutory information about the administration of passing the resolution. Once the resolution is signed, it cannot be revoked. And Section 296 makes that abundantly clear. So once that resolution is signed and is sent back, it can't be revoked. And so really, we, 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 then, we then have a situation where we're moving not in the landscape of a general meeting, but with a written resolutions, they're all sent out to the members, they all come back. And of course, then the, um, the motion, when we hit 75% of those voting rights is then carried, the new articles are adopted. And then in terms of the filing requirements, well, we have to, the law says that we have to submit a copy of the brand new set of articles to Companies House in addition with a copy of the resolution approving it. And you'll see when you go on to Companies House, you'll often see new articles that have been uh, filed yeah. along with the resolution. Perfect, thank you very much. Right, situation, we have a second situation, which I will share with the screen. This is my favorite, and I don't know who, was, who took part in writing this one, but anyway, here we go. The client is, um, a shareholder of a management company, which is a third party management company to the lease. So it's the usual tri-party lease situation. The client who is the shareholder believes that the directors of the managed company, management company have been naughty for various reasons. They've not been dealing with the service charge correctly. Um, we suspect they've been engaged in corrupt activities and brown envelopes have been passing. Um, and there's also false allegations or alleged false allegations have been made in respect, in respect of expenses claims. Our client 
um, wishes to call a meeting to remove the directors um, and join and get appointed to the board themselves. So how would we go about doing this as a shareholder, Andrew? Okay, so um, yeah, and actually all of these scenarios do, do come up more than, than uh, one would uh, potentially imagine. But yes, this is, this is a situation which again is commonplace. What happens in circumstances where shareholders feel that they are being genuinely abused in, in whatever shape or form or prejudice uh, that may occur. Now, the law is quite clear here. Section 303 of the Companies Act 2006 allows members to requisition the board to call a general meeting. Now that seems quite obvious but it was a marked change from the 1985 Companies Act which allowed members to simply call a general meeting. So the latest act has got rid of the ability for members to just do that on their whim. Instead they have the power to requisition the board to order the board to call a general meeting. Now the, the shape and form of that request of the board is, is intricate and it's very precise in order for the requisition to be deemed valid. The requisition itself has got to be in writing, it can be in hard copy or it can be sent on email. It's got to be signed by at least 5% of members who are entitled to vote. So if you don't have 5% that are able to sign the requisition, it, it's invalid. The requisition has got to state the general nature of the business that wishes to be conducted at the general meeting and it also has to set out the text of the resolution that is proposed to be voted upon. So dealing with content and form of this requisition, again this is in section 303, um, needs to be adhered to quite strictly. Um, I think in terms of what the directors then have to do, which is the next step, um, it's quite simple. They are obligated at law to call the meeting, whether they like it or not, uh, within a period of 21 days after receiving the request from the members. And the meeting has to be held within a period of 28 days from the date that they receive the request. So it moves quite quickly. Um, so th this is not a situation where the directors themselves have a unilateral ability just to ignore the requisition. They're not allowed to do that. And the law is clear that if they choose not to do that, then members can recoup the expenses that they've incurred in terms of that default by the board. And that might include, and this, sorry, this is recouping expenses from the company. And this might include, for example, where members have to go out and take legal advice in order to then consider what their options are. If that still doesn't work, then of course, what happens then? Well, the law goes on one step further and says that the members themselves can obtain, make an application and obtain a court order whereby the court will intervene and then the meeting will be held. So we go from what happens because of the problem to what the members do to how the directors respond and then hopefully without the court's intervention holding uh, the meeting as a consequence of that. Okay that's quite an interesting one for property managers because that I think uh, comes across comes up quite more frequently. Um, yeah. Right scenario three. Oh and I oh, yeah. should say just sorry one, one more point to add on to that. Um, in a sense, I missed the most important thing, and that is to say that to the extent that the members want to remove a director, the power to do so is contained in the Act at Section 168. And that means that in order to remove the director or directors, you need an ordinary resolution to pass uh, the motion requiring 50% of the voting. OK, so you can remove the director. Section 168 is the authority and you need an ordinary resolution to do that. All right. Thank you. Um, scenario three is the company's articles of association do not allow the board to appoint members to the board of directors. In order to achieve this, what kind of meeting would we need to call, Andrew? 
Okay, so here we've got uh, an alternative to amendment of the articles. Our scenario A looked at circumstances where we didn't want to hold a meeting, that we wanted a swift turnaround, and so therefore we proceeded by way of the written resolution option. We know that there are only two ways for members to vote on an amendment to articles. Uh, that's through written resolution or general meeting. So in this last scenario, this is affecting change to the articles through holding a general meeting. So what type of meeting are we holding? Well, it's just a general meeting. It will just be the board uh, in this instance calling for a general meeting. Now, in order to do that, um, the, the, our starting point is section 302 of the Companies Act, which empowers the board to call a general meeting on behalf of its members. Now, I'm sure that a lot of the viewers will know that in terms of calling a general meeting, there are certain steps that have to be taken to ensure that the meeting is held you know, validly. And one of those um, aspects, one of those administrative requirements is the insurance that 14 days clear notice is given of the holding of the meeting. And we know that, of course, we also need to make sure, because we've talked about it in the context of virtual meetings, that the notice has got to set out um, details of the general nature of the business to be transacted at the meeting, in this case, the amendment of the articles. Um, it's got to set out the full text of the resolution that members are going to be voting on. And it's also got to include a statement allowing a proxy to attend on behalf of a member as well. And anyone that's ever read articles of association will know that they, <laughs> that they, oh, is it just me, that they, um, they, they include this uh, right for a proxy um, to be voted upon. The notice can be given in electronic form or hard copy, sent to members, and the meeting is then held. And at that meeting, then the resolution will be passed to amend the articles. And again, same format as with the written resolution approach, which was um, at the end of the meeting, what do we do with Companies House? Well, we need to basically uh, submit a copy of the new articles that have been amended in tandem with a copy of the special resolution, because as we know also, you can only amend the articles with a, a special resolution. So that has to be filed as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. I know we've got, we're running out of time and I don't want to leave the webinar without doing the bit that you've been super excited about doing, which is the relevant parts of the Companies Act, I do believe. So I have a hat and I've got different sections of the Companies Act and I'm just going to test you. Right, go on then. You ready? Yeah, go on. You ready? Yeah. Okay. So first one that's been pulled out is section 303. What is that? So section 303, we've, we've covered that before. That is the power of the members, we've just talked about it, to requisition the board to call a general meeting. So people, this is why Andrew goes to sleep with the Companies Act and his blue book by his pillow, because he knows all about this and this is what makes it, him excited. Right, next one. The next one. Ready, ready? Yeah. Section 168. I remember this. You've you've covered this already. We've so section 168. Yeah. Can you remember what it can you remember what I said? <laughs> it's the basis for removing a director by ordinary resolution. You, you just read that off. I off did read the, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just read that. No, you're absolutely right. Ordinary resolution. So in our last scenario, we were talking about how what's the authority for removal, and it's 168, and it requires what percentage of votes? You remember that? Um, fifty percent. Fifty percent. Fifty percent ordinary resolution. Yeah. I did it. I didn't read that. Okay, next one. Before we come on to questions. Oh, okay. This one's a big one. Okay. So we've got one one three. What yeah. is that about? Uh, so section one one three is a. I think it's a legal obligation on the company to make sure it keeps its register of members. And that's significant because um, if you are a member of a company, holding a share certificate is not 
uh, it's not like holding title deeds to a property. It's, it's, it's tempting to think that by holding the share certificate, you actually, you know, you know, it's the evidence of your being a member. It isn't. Being in the register of members is the evidence of the fact that you are a member and you're not deemed a member unless you're in the register. And that means even if you hold a share certificate. So that's very, very important to make sure. OK, that's yeah, that's something that comes up with us. We're thrown at yes. that. We're thrown yeah. at that because um, loads of times at least holders come to us and they've got a share certificate. But they're, they're, if you look at the books or the mm. uh, filings that companies have, they're not up to date, which so the myth is uh, incorrect. It's the filings that are important or the stat books that yeah. are important rather than the company um, the yes. yes okay one more before we go on to questions uh section 303 what does that what's that about um well section 303 i think we've just covered that i think that was the first one 302. We did. oh 302 um 302 so 303 is the uh yes so 303 starts with our members power to requisition the board and then we move on to um the that section concerns itself with the director's power to then call a general meeting uh if they if they're obligated to do so yeah well done you passed the test <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, we've got a couple of minutes left. I think we've got like three minutes left before uh, we will get thrown off. Okay. Uh, just looking at some questions okay. that have come through. Um, we've got lots of questions about, um, well, it's centered around the theme that where you've got directors, um, or uh, sorry, you've got a company where people are just not wanting to be directors, what happens in that kind of situation? Yeah. What happens if no, nobody wants to be a director? Well, um, the, the company, as we said at the beginning, has got to have at least one director. Otherwise, you know, the, the shareholders, you know, they've got, they've got trouble on their hands. So the simple answer to that very robust question, it's a robust answer, which is you've got to go and get somebody somewhere to go and act as a director. You, you, yeah. you just have to find them. And in that situation, I presume if none of the leaseholders or shareholders members want to become directors, would it be possible or is it recommended or sensible that if the property is being managed by a managing agent, that the managing agent becomes a corporate director? Is that, have you come across situations like that? It, 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 I don't advise that that happens I, th I think it's important sometimes it's down to education and I think it's important for the shareholders themselves to make their own appointments for their company just from experience um, yeah. and it's very important that the individual takes on uh, the role and responsibility of the of the directorship yeah, well, uh, if there isn't any directors, if you're if we're talking about a freehold company that's been set up to purchase the freehold, mm. then obviously uh, the only thing that would happen is that the freehold would revert to the crown. Uh, so that's got to be enough motivation for someone to do something or yes, to step up true. as a director. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a management company, which is a third party to the tripartite lease, then mm. obviously management should technically revert back to the landlord in that situation so the leaseholders would miss out on mm -hmm. their opportunity to manage and where you've got a right to manage the implications of that is that the right to manage will be dissolved mm -hmm. um, and again management would revert back to the landlord mm -hmm. um, which again all three situations the consequences of not having a director to keep the company running and mm -hmm. going are quite draconian because mm -hmm. effectively you're losing management uh, mm -hmm. which is the very essence of why you went through this process in the first place. In the first place, yeah, understood. Um, I think we've got time for probably one more question. Um, just looking through, do LLP designated members have to declare an interest like company directors do? Uh, yes, they do. They're obligated uh, to do that, yeah. Okay, perfect. I think I can see Charlotte. I don't know if anybody else can see Charlotte. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but you've done an excellent session. We're just going to have to invite you back, aren't we, so you can finish off what you've started, because clearly there's lots of questions here for you.
and they'll just keep coming, I think. But we'll um, send all your details out um, on an email to everybody after this session. So if anybody wants to get in contact with you, you're both able and around to help with any other queries that people might have. Okay. Yeah, we do. So that's, thank, you. thank you so much for that. And we will be um, running uh, a leasehold knowledge week um, at the end of March. So we will let everybody know about that um, a little bit. Well, probably next week we'll publish some details of that. But all I can say is thank you so much for your time today. Great session. And, um, and we'll see you all soon. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you Bye. very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you.